HTML5 and web development. This is basically on ease of development and some of the CDI uh, things um, that we're doing. I already mentioned some, you know, the JAXRS team is looking to align with CDI a little bit better. Um, but uh, one of the things that we've been doing over various releases of Java EE is basically decomposing the EJB model, right? Um, it used to have just a ton of functionality in it. And um, so what we've done now, for example, is in Java EE 7, if you wanted to, to do transactions and have them just automatically be, uh, have your code run inside of a transaction, you would use an EJB, right? In EE 7, we basically add in the transaction annotation that under the hood uses CDI um, interceptors, but the idea is now I can just put add transactional on a method and any method right, that has that transaction will run inside of a transaction. Something similar here, where with Java EE security, uh, we're basically taking that model from EJB, where you have, for example, at roles allowed, um, that basically says you have to be a certain role to execute this EJB method. Um, we're now going to let you do that within uh, basically any POJO, any, any plain old Java object, uh, any method inside of POJO. And in fact, we're going to enhance it. So before, it was fairly fixed, where you just say, uh, if you're in this role, then you can execute this method. Now what we're doing is we're uh, basically using the expression language, um, uh, what is it, EL30 now um, in Java EE7. Using the expression language where you can use uh, the expression to define um, that constraint. So in this case, in the first example, we're saying uh, you're authorized to invoke this method if you're in the role of manager and you're within the scheduled office hours, all right? So it's actually pretty flexible. Um, in the next one, it's um, another example um, with additional context, right? So it's also contextual, where, well, we'll let you call get salary if the invoker is in the role of manager and that employee is a direct report of that manager, right? Um, pretty cool stuff. Right? Just, that's, Java EE really is becoming more and more of just a POJO model um, that just uses annotations to, to declare what you want, right? And this is just another example. Um, this is more of another example, and I don't know too much about this one, so I have to apologize. But they have, uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're reaching out to an external source that has um, authorization <coughs> rules, and we're saying, get the rule of report and apply that constraint to display report, right? Yes? Is there going to be anything that maybe, like an annotation where you could run a custom method to figure out the security? That's a good question. Based on what I've seen so far, um, that's probably, that third one is probably the closest where some ex external source has that constraint. Okay. Um, but, this is kind of getting a little bit early into kind of my call to action where, you know, it's kind of like the JSRs are out there, right? Anyone can look at the specs as they're being developed. They have, it's all being done in the public. With public mailing lists, the, spec, the specs are in kind of a draft form. Even it's actually, it's pretty early draft, but they kind of written up what their thoughts are so far. And um, provide that feedback. That's excellent feedback. Right? Just get on the mailing list and say, hey, this is something that I can find really useful. Here's the use case. What do you think? Right? Or maybe someone's already brought it up on the user list. Right? So that's actually a good requirement. Uh, so I got more security coming. Um, JMS 2.1, if you look at message-driven beans today, um, it's basically um, an EJB. Right? And uh, we're looking to, to simplify the usage of uh, message-driven beam to basically let you apply um, an annotation to any Java beam um, to make that beam then become a message-driven message beam. It doesn't have to be um, an EJB per se. And that's just another example, right? I talked about transaction, we talked about security interceptor, analysis. This is another example where we're kind of decomposing that very feature-rich EJB model um, and just let you apply it not just to EJBs, but just any Java object, right? So as, as we move forward, it seems like um, 
the alignment between EJBs and CDIs became a little bit more gray, right? Or not, not an alignment, it's becoming stronger, but um, it's really just moving more and more toward a, a, a pulling the wall. You know, will we ever completely get rid of EJBs? I don't know, right? There's still some features out there like pooling of objects, right, that don't exist in, Java, in anything else but Java E. No, sorry, in anything else but EJBs. All right, so this is just an example of using um, uh, in, in EJB, uh, sorry, uh, JMS MDBs, I should say, uh, today, where you have, you, know, you have to define your uh, set of properties to define which queue that you want to get your messages from. And then you have to implement a message which sort of interface to provide the method uh, on, on message that basically is invoked whenever a new message comes on the queue. Right? And so, they're looking to simplify that down to basically, you know, here's a Java class, and I'm just going to apply a JMS listener to a method. And whenever uh, a message comes across, the, comes across my queue, just invoke this message, right? Less configuration, and just trying to make it as simple as possible. In, in, in fact, if you look at Java E7, um, has anyone used the JMS API before? A, a couple of folks? Has anyone tried it with Java E7? It's actually gotten a lot easier. Where the number of lines of code to like send a message uh, or put a message on the queues, just a couple lines of code, whereas in the past it was just a ton of work. A ton of boilerplate code just to send and receive messages. So a lot of work has been done in JMS2, and this is just another area to kind of simplify the API. Pruning. Um, like I said, no one spent their virtual money to take things away, but it's, it is important to take away obsolete technology so the platform doesn't, you know, just get bigger and bigger. So, um, in, for example, in EE7, we got rid of the old style EJBs, right? EJB3 has been around for a long time now, uh, or the new model, yeah, EJB3 has been around since 2006, so we can get rid of the old style stuff because no one uses them anymore. And, um, there's a very formal process for de deprecating functionality in Java EE, where first, in a release, we propose that we're going to get rid of a technology, obsolete it basically. It's already, it's already been kind of supplanted by a newer, better way of doing things. So we have, in Java EE 6, we basically said, we are proposing that we make the old style EJBs optional. Same thing with Jack's RPC. Um, so that in the next release, Java EE 7, um, Vendors don't have to implement it. And sure enough, that's what happened. Now, vendors can still implement the old technologies. They're considered optional, right? It's proposed optional in a release, and the following release, they become optional. So if a vendor decides they want to implement it, they still have to comply with that spec. Even though it's an old spec, they still have to comply with it, right? And so in this case, we're getting rid of the old uh, EJB 2 client view. Um, we basically had to go out and define uh, an, an, an interface, um, uh, a home interface and the object interface, and now it's basically just a plain old job interface in JB3, right? So it's already gotten a lot simpler. No one does the old stuff anymore, you know? Only one person doing J2EE in here, right? Everyone else has kind of moved on to Java EE, so deprecating the old stuff is okay. So, uh, modernizing the infrastructure. Um, this is the third thing where we, we've been introducing some cloud-related things and beginning with Java E7. In fact, when we first started doing Java E7, we were too aggressive, and then all the vendors kind of came back and we said, you know what, we don't have a lot of experience implementing clouds, right? IBM was building a cloud, Oracle, or, um, Sun, we're, we're building clouds, and IBM, and everyone was building clouds. Let's start building clouds, and then we'll start introducing the, you know, the actual APIs. So we kind of scaled back a little bit uh, on cloud E7, but we did, for example, introduce um, permissions on XML, which you can actually define um, which permissions your application requires in Java E7, and stick that in a permissions.xml file. Um, along with your, you know, your, the archive that you're going to deploy, and it will actually check those permissions at deployment time, 
and say, sorry, we can't give you these and the deploy will fail, right? Versus before that, you deploy your app, it runs fine until it hits a permission, it doesn't like it and starts throwing exceptions, right? So at least you know ahead of time. And in the cloud environment, you can't go back and, you know, you, you can't go back and, and fix configurations in a lot of cases, right? When we're talking about platform as a service, right? A lot of, a lot of platforms might lock down uh, their implementation and not give you a console that lets you configure things. So it's, it's in that context that we're thinking about some of these things. Okay, so the first is J2E uh, management. And that tells you how old the spec is, right? I think, have I found a J2EE versus Java EE hard enough yet? Uh, so this is basically going through a revamp um, where you basically, there's multiple models um, for managing your app server with um, GSR 77. You can use SNMP, you can use um, WebM and SIM, or you can use basically uh, managing APIs and GMX, which is what most people do. Um, so basically what we're looking at doing is simplifying a lot of that um, and layering a RESTful API on top of it, right? So now if you want to do administrative tasks using a tool, um, you could, well, you used to do that using tools or some GMX console or something. Now you can just make RESTful calls to your app server and you can apply configurations, change things, uh, also do monitoring as well, right? In fact, with monitoring, it'll basically be service sent events or something, just sending you a stream of data, right, or something like that. So, um, we already have some examples. So Glassfish has had a RESTful API for, since Glassfish 3, um, in 2009. And WebLogic, I think, has a RESTful API. I think Wildfly now has a RESTful API. And so I think a lot of vendors have been adding it. Now let's just kind of standardize it. And it won't be, here's the deploy bird, right? Here's, you know, XYZ bird. It'll be more about how do you navigate there. Um, think, of, you know, think about it like hypermedia as an interstate kind of thing, right? Where you can go in and figure out what the capabilities are there and then execute on those capabilities. I think the one, one, one kind of departure from that is around the deployment interface. They want to have a very easy to use, very simple um, RESTful deployment interface so you can deploy your apps basically using a RESTful call. Security. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, um, just a few. The first is password aliasing. So, one of the things that we had to deal with, right? If, you know, if you think about connecting to a database, right, you have your credentials, username, and password, right, where do you store your password, right? You don't want it to be through text anywhere. So, you know, vendors approach it their own ways. The way we do it in Glassfish is we basically let you stick in uh, a string like this, here's an alias for a password. And then you can actually take that password and restore it in a secure key store that the application server owns. So that when you connect to the database, it sees the alias, and then uh, it goes to the, uh, the the secure store and actually pulls it out of that secure store, right? So that's basically something that we're looking to do in Java E8, right? Something very similar to that. And I think in the example I gave, that secure secure store was actually coupled with the database. I think they're all, sorry with the application server. I think what they're looking to do as well is maybe you can ship that credential database, which is basically a highly encrypted file along with your application, right? So I think that might be something they're doing as well. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, with the app. Okay. Yes. Any OAuth uh, integration? Yeah, OAuth. I think I forgot to bring this up. I think they're looking at that in, J in, in JAXRS. So if you look at Jersey, um, Jersey, which is the reference implementation for JAXRS, but it also goes well beyond it, right? And it has a lot of other things. OAuth 1 and 2 are already supported. I think I forgot to bring that up, so I'm glad you did bring that up. Um, that they're looking at OAuth in, in JAXRS. So, so and that now would be OAuth providing your app as an OAuth service? And from what I saw, it was client server. Okay. So it'd be as a service, but also as a client, and calling a service. Tied into the 
this for you, Anthony? Yeah. That? that would make sense. I don't know. Um, I, I know that the spec leads um, do talk about that kind of stuff, right? So, for example, the JetSRS guys are already talking to Jason Landon guys, right? Um, and the same thing with CDI. CDI is owned by Red Hat, uh, but most of the other specs are kind of internal in case it's a proposal and calls or items or whatever. So I think this, that's another case, right, where they'll call Alex owns, um, uh, I forgot his last name, I can't pronounce his last name, Kavlovsky or something like that. He owns the security JSR, right, and um, uh, uh, Merrick Potokar, Potokar um, he owns the JXRS spec. And so those guys, those guys will just talk directly and it'll be in spec probably, hopefully, right? That's a very good example, I think. So, oh, I didn't really talk, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close enough. Um, another thing that we're looking at is user management. So if you look at user management, most app servers let you define users and passwords so that when you connect, right, you can authenticate. Um, or you can go off to an LDAP store and do it, right, or to a database or whatever. But the way you do it is through configuration, through a configuration console to set up that security domain um, with the app server. But if, they, if you think about a cloud environment, a lot of times you can't get to the console to do that. So basically what they're looking at doing is creating kind of this user domain set of APIs to manage users and, uh, and groups, right? So you don't have to access the, uh, the app server configuration, right? So basically a user level um, API, and there'll be support for databases. I think there's a minimum set of uh, stores like LDAP and a database maybe in a cloud system. And everything else is just you know up to the implementer. Uh, same thing with user management. So that was, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going way too far. One more. Okay, so what, we're, what, we, what you see here is it's a lot like a data source definition. If you see if you've seen data source definition where you, you, find all, you find all the metadata for that source of information. In the case of a database, right, it's the connect string, the credentials, and so on. It'll be something very similar for a user source definition, right? And you'll be able to create the users and groups and uh, get attributes about the user and so on, right, using this API. And this is just a, a kind of, again, model map of data source definition where you can, uh, in this case, we're using annotations. I'm assuming there's going to be some external way in your code to define these, to provide this metadata, kind of like, you know, you have a web.xml or persistence.xml or GPA. I'm assuming there's going to be an external way to do this as well. But here we're doing maybe an annotation where we're basically saying, here, the source of our users is going to be this LDAP directory. And here's, here's the name I'm going to expose to my application. Here's the URL of the LDAP server and the credentials, right? That's the metadata. And then down here, in your actual code, all you do is just say, well, here's the resource. I'm going to inject the resource using uh, wherever, you know, whatever the name of this resource is up here that I I'm going to inject it, and then I can just execute whatever things I need to do regarding that user and how that object will like. In this case, um, it's actually going to um, determine if a user's uh, account is enabled in this case. Role mapping, so basically, uh, if you think about groups and roles, right, this is pretty common in, uh, in the LDAP where, you know, Java EE has a concept of roles, but LDAP has a concept of groups, right? And, um, you know, users belong to groups, but not all runtimes understand that roles and users can, sorry, groups and users can belong to roles, and then those roles can be the constraints that you leverage within your application. I hope that makes sense. I need a diagram. But the idea is basically uh, role mapping. So uh, what a lot of application servers do, for example, is they basically do that role mapping um, for you where um, you can assign roles to users and groups, 
based on some application specific models. What um, some app servers would do today by default is say, you know what, if, they, if you configure it, but if, if you belong, you know, if you want, you can say, this group automatically belongs to a role of the same name. So any user that belongs to that group in LDAP is considered a role inside of Java EE, right? They'll be, they'll be more clearly defined in a spec like this. And again, you don't have to go to the application server to configure it. You can do it all in kind of in user space within the application. Uh, so this is uh, another example, very similar to the last one we saw. You can see again, there's pretty flexible sources for information. Um, a data source, basically a database, LDAP, something in memory, something custom. Um, and again, you just uh, look at the resource um, using, uh, or inject it using uh, the app resource application. And then you can, uh, for example, in this case, you can the roles that belong to a user. Okay. So it's, that's not a lot of code that you have to write to do that. Um, there's a lot more. Uh, I've talked about, I think there's a lot of these. I haven't really talked about JSF or CDI. Uh, but these are, are the um, JSRs right now that are more likely, they're either major JSRs or like major enhancements like Server 40, Server 40. Um, some of them have a smaller number of features like JSF. I think they're doing some things around AJAX and CDI. But, um, kind of smaller incremental features. But all of these, I think, are going to be dot releases, uh, either new release or dot release of existing JSR. Okay. Um, and then a lot of other JSR will have um, maintenance releases. Basically, I mentioned it before, there are many clarifications, but you know, we may need to adjust the JSR to work properly with the new features of the new JSR. It's not really a, a big feature thing, so it doesn't get a new JSR number. It's just kind of a maintenance release um, of the existing one. Okay. okay, so I talked briefly about this earlier. Java EE is developed in a very transparent manner. And um, feel free to go out there and take a look at some of these GSRs, you know, the ones that didn't trust you, you know, go take a look at the mailing list and you see them defining, arguing in a lot of cases back and forth in a constructive manner about we should have this, well, no, but that, we can't do that because of something else, right? And you could read that entire conversation and you could actually participate, right? So it's not read-only mode, just go in and, and, and comment. Um, and let's see, the JIROs, a lot of these things are posted as JIROs. Um, to maintain um, the, the draft of the spec. So once you get a spec out, then we can start tracking it in JIRA in terms of how they want to change the draft. Um, you can download the reference implementations of these things. In fact, there's early builds of MVC right now that you can go play with. There's early builds of JSF 2.3 that you can go play with. Right? In fact, um, Adam Bean, um, any of you guys heard of Adam Bean? Yeah, I think you do. <laughs> Um, so, um, go to Adam B or B I E N. Yes, B I E N. dot com. He's a consultant out of Europe, and he's a Java EE guru, and he does tons of uh, these screencasts. Everything Java EE, you know, he probably has a screencast on it. And he's already played with the MVC spec, right? So it's it's uh, it's pretty cool. So, how can you get involved? All right. So there's you individually that I talked about, but what we're what we're also doing is, is a formal program called an Adopt the JSR, where Java user groups as a whole get involved. And the idea there is by adopting a JSR, um, what they're doing is they're basically committing to participating in the evolution of that JSR. And that, so for example, the Chicago Java user group has adopted, I think, JSF and Java EE. And so that means they take a look at the, uh, the specs, they follow discussions, they comment on them, they post bugs on the reference implementation, right? Um, they basically get to be pretty active in it. And this is kind of a, a, a Java user group with juggling thing. So, San Diego Java could do that. So, you know what, we all, you know, a lot of us
us find JSR or whatever interesting, let's adopt it and provide feedback on it. So I think we have some of the of like 15 or 20 jugs worldwide that are participating in various JSRs that way. And Glassfish will be the reference implementation, glassfish.next, whether it's Spy or whatever. Um, so you'll be able to download, um, I mentioned earlier that you download these bits. So if you go off to their websites, um, I'll talk about that briefly in a second, you can download their reference implementation for just that JSR. But at some point, they'll be mature enough where they'll start kind of all coming together and in Glassfish. And there'll be, at some point, like a, a build of Glassfish where you can play out, play with it more in, in the end manner, right, with a lot of the job EE functionality in there. Um, probably the easiest way to figure out where to go, to read the specs, to figure out where the open, you know, where, where the, web, the public websites are where they kind of actively track this stuff, just go to jcp.org, search on the technology, search, search on MVC, and then it'll take you to the page, it'll tell you what the scope of it is. It'll say, here's where we have the wiki, the mailing list, the downloads, and all that stuff. Right? So I highly encourage everybody to do that. And that's it, the end. Um, you can always email me, uh, john.clingon at oracle.com, and uh, I'll help out any way I can. And are there any questions? I know it's kind of a fire hose of information. Gives you a little bit of feel for what's going to be in Java EE8. Um, we were targeting we're, Java 1, is kind of this goal that we set, um, of 2016. We're, we're late with the early drafts of the specs, of a lot of the specs that we don't have. So the JCP has this very formal process in the evolution of a standard, right, or a spec. And so a lot of the specs are late with the first one. Um, so I don't know if that's going to impact the end result of the, you know, when Java EE will be available. But we, we, back when we first started, right, in 2013, we kind of set a goal for ourselves for Java 1 in 2016. It's kind of hard to see that far, far ahead, but uh, we'll see. Right. Any questions? I'm sorry? Uh, will it come in the form of an update that we need to, I mean, Java EE, what will what be updated? I'm trying to understand the package for Java. Ah, okay, so the good question is, are these things packaged with Java, they, like JDK, right? And the answer is, is they are not, because um, the JDK is specific to, think, think of it as, um, uh, historically, it was Java ME, right, which is for devices. The JDK or Java SE was desktops. And then Java Enterprise Edition was kind of the enterprise stuff. So historically, they've had very different distributions, right? So if you wanted the JDK, you, just, you go to Oracle.com and you download the JDK. The problem is not everybody needs all those enterprise features, especially in the, you know, like the embedded space. Um, so if you want these features, the first place to go is to the spec site, right, that I mentioned. Go to um, jcp.org, they'll tell you where to go to, to look at the specs. Almost all of them are on Java. <laughs> um, and you can play with them. The way they'll actually come to you in a usable form in, in more of an end-to-end programming model is through Glassfish first. And then the other vendors will um, eventually adopt them as well, right? So Time of Tribe, is over there, they'll have an implementation of the web profile, and, and maybe then some um, Oracle Web Logic, IBM WebSphere, right, and, and so on. They'll all have Wildfly and GWAS Enterprise App Platform. Those are the dis distributions, those are the ways that you're hands on the enterprise stuff. And so there's uh, 30 implementations. I think there's 20 plus of uh, implementations of Java EE6, and Java EE7 so far, there's four implementations and more coming, and but that's the full platform. And the web profile is just a web, you know, if, you, if all you want to do is build a web app, there's two today, but there's a new one, right? So Java 1, there's, there, there should be more. 
And if not, they'll announce, you know, they're still working on that. When did John the E7 come out? John the E7 came out in uh, June 11th or 12th of 2015. So what vendors are Oh, okay. Yeah, so the vendors, so there's four today, right, implementations. There's Glassfish, which is not a commercial app server anymore. It's just a reference implementation. Uh, and, you know, it's a good way to do end-to-end -end job EE development as a developer, right? Just not really commercially oriented. Uh, WebLogic has some job EE seven features like JaxRS, JSON, WebSockets, and the latest GPA standard. But it's not a fully compatible, you know, with all of job EE seven specs. Oracle has announced that for this calendar year. I can't be more specific for that. It's an Oracle policy, right? IBM, I know, is working on it, right? Um, I know Tomatribe is, is working on a web profile plus a couple of other JSRs um, for Java E7 support. So for today, by the end of the year, you'll have more. I, you know, I, I don't want to put a number on it. Four but five. basically, it's, since two years since the reference. Yeah, it's a four. So there's a lot, um, I, I guess, uh, work from the application people. Yeah. So think about it, think about it this way. Um, a lot of these vendors don't just build an app server. They build like an entire suite of products. So they might be building an app server, but they have to test their entire suite of products on top of that thing they want to ship, right? So, you know, if you, if you look at Oracle, for example, right, you got an ESB, I've right, got a portal, you got all these things that run on top of an app server. And you gotta make sure that when you ship a compliant version that, you know, a lot of these, app, these other product groups inside your organization run out there, right? So there's a lot of coordination within a company. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a pretty feature rich standard, right? So there's a lot of things to, to think about um, in terms of implementing it. And then you got <coughs> A lot of it's just a QA process, right? The engineering, right? For example, for WebLogic was done a while ago, and now it's just QA, 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 QA. So, like any product. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you talked before about a React a reactive programming model and asynchronous. Yes. Did and are you leveraging Scala for for any of that, or is it your own implementation? Are we leveraging Scala? Um, yeah, there's nothing Scala there per se, because it's not Java. <laughs> well, but, but well, it, it is. Well, it's not, yeah, okay. So, um, there isn't, I, I don't think, what they've done, it, it, I encourage you to go watch um, the Java 1 presentation that Merritt did, uh, where he basically, you know, if you want to just skip the sections, it's on parlays, if, which is really nice because it shows the video and the slides, and he, when you look at the slide, you know, click, just go on to the next slide, next slide, until you find the one you want, right? And this is true of all the presentations, including the job EE one, that's my plug. Um, and you can go to the section that basically says, uh, here, here's the reactive one. So we, so we, you know, we looked at Rx Java, we looked at all these other things, um, and this is what we're thinking about, right? And they might have looked at Scala, right? I'm sure they, you know, they, they understand Node reactive programming as well, although it's dynamic versus, versus more static. Um, so they aren't coming into this very necessarily narrowly, you know, with a narrow background. Um, they're definitely looking at it from a broader perspective, but they want it to be consistent with the way Java does things and be consistent with the way Java EE does things, right? So it may be the greatest whiz bang thing, but if it doesn't fit into the programming model of Java EE, it, it would be an odd man out. So, okay. yeah. The best answer I can get for that one, but yeah, seriously, go go watch that one. In fact, there was um, I think there was there was an entire session I think at Java One was it on reactive programming with JaxRS? Uh, and you can probably I didn't, I didn't see that one, but uh, I was at the other one. Yes, any other questions? Are your slides going to be up somewhere? I can put the slides up. Yeah, I'll email you the slides. We have a site on our uh, sdjug.org website. Have the slides for this presentation along with the video. Hopefully, the audio will come down. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I try to keep the volume up. Hopefully, I didn't trail off. And I tend to talk a little fast, so I apologize to the folks on the, 
Okay, great. Thank you very much.